Okay, everybody, so let's go through some nervous system mapping, uh, which is super simple, and some of you are going to get flashbacks from the skeletal system lecture, and that's totally okay, because it always helps to reinforce the content. But let's start with the feet, and we will map our guidelines. So the shoulder line guideline where the toes meet the ball of the foot, then we have the diaphragm guideline where the ball of the foot meets the distal arch, then we have the proximal head of the fifth metatarsal, the waistline guideline that comes across, which is basically separating the metatarsals from the tarsals. And then we have around the ridge of the heel, um, technically starting at the proximal edge of the cuboid notch uh, would be our pelvic line guideline. So those are our guidelines. Um, but one thing that I really wanted to get into is the idea of the spine um, as the nervous system kind of central reflex point. So let's let's get into that. Obviously, from a from just a nervous system perspective, we have the big toe, which would represent the head space, and so that would be all the brain area. Um, the brain we know takes up a majority of the skull, but on most maps, what you'll see. Uh, is this nice little crescent shape over the top of the big toes um, like the brain is just in the scalp it's not it's it's all throughout the headspace so I just like to view the entire um, big toe as headspace but then we also have all of the pads of the toes which would represent that um, headspace as well. Also the nails of the toes, very very important for us to take into consideration because they are the screen of the mind. So they do give us a lot of insight as far as what's happening neurologically with somebody. But now that we have the brain mapped, we can then move into the various parts of the spine that relate to the, the uh, central nervous system kind of branching into the peripheral nervous system. So let's get into the neck. So we have the cervical spine on the medial edge of the big toes. Um, technically, cervical spine could also be uh, all throughout the necks of the toes. If you really wanted to be uh, specific about it, we'll also get into some uh, vertical zone stuff as well during the course of this lecture. Then we have the upper half of the thoracic spine, so T1 to T7. That's going to be around the bunion area and the nerves that run through that chest space. Then let's see, what color do we want? Well, we'll do yellow. So then we have the lower half of the thoracic spine, which is going to be T8 through T12. And then for the lumbar spine, we have that proximal arch, that area that always tends to hold fluid because it's just a fluid filled area, that L1 to L5 space. And then we have the sacral spine, which is on the medial surface of the calcaneus. Okay, so that is a very pretty diagram of our spinal cord and the various extensions of that. Uh, when we look at the nervous system, it is very important to understand that, especially when we get into um, the pathology and areas of emphasis for certain sites of dysfunction, whether it be stroke, damage, um, symptomology of any kind, we want to check that this nervous system is intact, that the actual bones aren't impinging anywhere, and that spinal reflex really gives us an idea um, of what is happening in those particular areas, because it's not just, you know, if somebody has a bunion, we have to recognize that if that truly represents the upper thoracic spine and the nerves that go from that thoracic spine have to pass through that really congested bunion space and the reflexes, there might be some tendency for frozen shoulder. There might be some tendency for carpal tunnel. There might be some tendency for weird arm hand tingling, but as well as like heart palpitations and things like that. So we just want to be aware from a nervous system perspective. Then when we look at the vertical zones, the vertical zones are important from a nervous system perspective because they do tell us a lot about influence. So when we look at horizontal zone one, vertical zone one, in line with the big toe, you know, we can see how the mental space, how the thought process is affecting the various horizontal zones. We can also see how the alignment of the head and neck is affecting the, uh, the spine. This really ties into craniosacral therapy nicely from a theory standpoint, because vertical zones, the alignment of the head and neck, if that's impinged at all, it's going to influence all of these other horizontal zones. 
But then if we look at vertical zones two, three, four, and five, this gives us an idea of how the, like from horizontal zone one, how zone two is affecting zone one. So how the alignment of the shoulders is affecting the neck. Then we have zone three, how the upper digestive system is influencing the neck. Then we have zone four, how the lower digestive system, hips, reproductive, urinary system affecting the neck. Then we have that outside of the heel representing that vertical zone influence of five, zone five, that lower body on zone one, that horizontal zone of the head and neck. So the toes really do give you an example from a nervous system perspective using the vertical zones of what areas might be hitting that nervous system central command in the brain uh, through using the vertical zone theory. Okay? So that's just fun stuff. Let's take that and let's move on to the hands. Yay, hands. Let's map our zones. So we have shoulder line guideline just above that proximal thumb joint and where the fingers insert onto the palmer knuckles, then just below the proximal thumb joint and just below the palmer knuckles. Then we have the proximal head of the fifth metacarpal that's our waistline guideline. And then in between the two rows of carpals, which you can't really see as well because there isn't really a defined you know, arch in the hand, um, they are kind of clustered. So we just make that line representing the, uh, the distal row of carpals and the proximal row of carpals for uh, zone four and five. So then we have the pad of the thumb and the pads of each of the fingers representing our brain reflexes. And again, if you want it to be a little bit more traditional, a little crest at the top of the thumb. Do, do, do. Okay, then we'll go into our spinal reflexes. So as with all the other hand mapping, we want to be careful because the thumb represents the alignment with the big toe. So that thumb is vertical zone one. Even when we have the hands rotated outward from a anatomical perspective, uh, that might make you think that the little finger is zone one, but it is not. The little finger represents um, vertical zone five, whereas the thumb represents vertical zone one. So we want to make sure that we are on the thumb side when mapping the spine. Cervical spine. What would be the lateral edge of the thumb because we're using lateral terminology because it's uh, the anatomical position as opposed to the medial aspect of the thumb. If we were to put the hands together like this, they would represent the feet with the, the big toes um, on the medial surface, but because we're using anatomical position, that puts the medial surface of the thumb as the lateral surface of the thumb. I know. When will modern medicine ever not be complicated? Okay, so then we have horizontal zone two, that upper thoracic space. And here's where it gets kind of crappy with the mapping in terms of spinal stuff because we have this itty bitty, itty bitty space uh, for the lower thoracic vertebra. But that's just how the hands are wired. Then we have lumbar spine and sacral spine. Huzzah. And if we wanted to look at the vertical zones of influence, that's a really quick drawing um, and the, the maps are much better. Uh, but here is the idea that, again, vertical zone two, that second finger represents how the shoulder is influencing the headspace. Third finger, how the upper digestive is influencing the headspace. Fourth finger, how hips. Uh, bladder, urinary, low back, reproductive, um, all influencing the headspace, and then vertical spine, how the lower body is influencing the, the headspace. So like knees, uh, muscles of the legs, things like that. Okay, so that would be our hands. Now let's move on to face. Okay, so we have the face here. Let's draw our lines, so give her a big old unibrow for the shoulder line guideline. Then we have underneath the zygomatic ridge. Then we extend the lip line for 
or the waistline, and then the ridge of the chin becomes the pelvic line. Our spinal reflexes would start with the brain up top. So that would be the entire forehead space, specifically just above the, the ridge, the, the lower ridge of the forehead. So all of this would technically be brain space. And if you really wanted to be specific, more towards the hairline would be the traditional way to look at it. But then we have the cervical spine, upper thoracic, mid thoracic, lumbar. and sacral coccyx. There we go. Then we have our vertical zones for the face. So vertical zone one is going to be the side of the nose. That's going to be our guideline for that. Then we have between the side of the nose, um, which is also that, that inner part, the tear duct of the eye. Zone two is going to be the, uh, the medial sclera that white part of the eye on the medial side. Then we have the iris and pupil. Then we have the lateral sclera, and then everything on the outside of the face in the temple area. Those are going to be our vertical zones. So throughout the head, very interesting if somebody especially has like forehead acne, what would be the, the appropriate zones to map and look at with the influences of the other spaces? Yay, face. Last but not least, the ears. So let's draw our zones. Top of the helix, triangular fossa, the ridge between the symbaconca capum concha, and then just above the earlobe, below the auditory opening. Those are our four zones. That would make the brain area all of this. Crest of the helix. Do a little bit of traditional stuff. Boop, boop. Then we have cervical spine. Thoracic spine, upper thoracic spine. Lower thoracic spine. A little hard to see the yellow on this picture. Trust me, it's there. Then we have lumbar spine, which weaves right around that tragus. And then sacral spine. Cool. Then we have our vertical zones. The ver vertical zones of the ears, um, again, you just need to know a little bit of anatomy. So vertical zone one is going to be that spinal reflex in line with the tragus. Then we have the intertragic notch, that dip in between the tragus and antitragus. Then we have the antitragus. And then we have this nice little ridge right here, and it forms a line in between the outside of the helix. And we are going to throw our last guideline in between that ridge and the outside of the helix, and those are our vertical zones for the ear. Yay, ear! So I hope that you've enjoyed this mapping session with the nervous system. We've covered a lot of spinal stuff, but also a lot of vertical zone stuff, which I hope you found valuable, um, and hope that you've enjoyed coloring along with me.